Are you okay on the camera? Uh, this mic is just for the camera, correct? There's no, we have to use our classroom voices so that everybody can hear us uh, in here today. Uh, I'm Van Romero, I'm the Vice President for Research uh, at New Mexico Tech, and I'll be, um, I, I'll, I wanna say moderating this discussion today. Um, uh, our team is over here to the left. When we came into this room uh, earlier today, it was set up with a table over here, and we thought that was just way too confrontational to have a table between us and you. So we tried to move off to the side and yet have some space where we can take notes and, and things. So I apologize for the way the, um, the flow pattern traffic is here, but uh, I think it's about as uh, good as we can do. Um, anyway, uh, New Mexico Tech uh, is here tonight to talk about our independent review of the uh, WIP site incident. The genesis of how we got here was um, shortly after uh, the event occurred and uh, a number of, of investigations were going on. Uh, there was uh, numerous uh, local people, uh, and by local I mean elected officials, who were concerned that all of the investigations that were taking place were really um, uh, um, they were uh, a product of the DOE activity. And so they were all uh, directed by uh, DO DOE direction. And there was certain people, uh, certainly our elected officials, uh, both senators and certainly uh, Congressman Pierce were very adamant about some independent New Mexico uh, review of uh, what had happened. Uh, and so Ryan Flynn, uh, Secretary of uh, of the environment also got involved at that time and uh, thanks to Ryan Flynn, Congressman Pierce, uh, Senator Heinrich, Senator Udall, um, the DOE was convinced that yes it would be uh, worthwhile for an independent New Mexico group to take a look at what the DOE uh, had discovered in its various investigations. Our job is not to conduct an investigation, um, we are just reviewing the work that went on. We're grading homework. Uh, if you will, is, is the responsibility uh, that we have. Uh, if we could turn down the lights just a little bit, uh, I think it'll be easier to see. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Is that everybody okay? Not, not too, too dark? Please, I, I want this to be as informal as possible. Ask questions, uh, feel free to interrupt. I'd um, be happy to, to ask, uh, uh, answer any of your questions. Uh, the folks sitting to my side here will uh, jump at the chance to answer any questions. I'd like to introduce them uh, real quick. Um, I'll start uh, in the lower right-hand corner is uh, Mike Hensley. Uh, Mike uh, does a lot of strategic development for me. He spends a lot of time down here in southern New Mexico. And uh, he's from, um, originally from Silver City. Uh, spent a little bit of time outside New Mexico, but for the most part is a, is a dyed-in-the-wool New Mexican. Um, next on the bottom is Julie Ford. She's a professor of te technical communications. She's sitting in the middle of the table. She's been here in New Mexico for about 15 years, Julie. Some close to that. Um, we decided to get somebody with tech with communication skills uh, to be part of this group because as you all probably know when you're talking to physicists and engineers we don't do a real good job of uh, uh, communicating to the public what we really have found out so uh, we thought it was important to do that and Julie has been responsible for all the website if you followed the website stuff and any of our reports she puts it together um, and thank God because otherwise we would have a mess on our hands. Uh, next on the bottom is uh, Naveed Moshtavai. Naveed is sitting right there. Naveed has been at New Mexico Tech for over 30 years. Uh, he's the chairman of our uh, minerals engineering, our minerals uh, and mining uh, activity at New Mexico Tech and has a lot of experience uh, with, um, uh, has done work on WIP uh, over the years and, and uh, had a chance to interact with uh, some of you here. Uh, Ali Fakimi is next. Uh, Ali is uh, down at the end. Um, Ali's been at Tech again for about 15 years too, right? Uh, he is the modeling expert, so he knows how um, to model, use computer models to look at how um, events occur and, and can track those through uh, uh, under different circumstances. In the upper right-hand corner, we have uh, Gina Chavez. Uh, she's my assistant. She's made all the arrangements for everything, uh, and uh, she's a lifelong Socorro native. Uh, uh, Melissa Candelaria Lyons uh, is a graduate student at New Mexico Tech. She'll soon have her Ph.D. Her area of expertise is um, unconventional explosives. Uh, so not the standard type of explosives that we think of like dynamite and TNT and stuff like that, but 
but homemade explosives and other chemical reactions that can become energetic. Um, obvious reason for having someone like that on the team. And uh, Melissa's from Farmington and uh, went to another school up north of New Mexico Tech for a while, but she saw the, saw the light and came to New Mexico Tech. Uh, Jeff Altig is uh, right here next to me. He's uh, chairman of our chemistry department uh, and uh, has been here for 10 years. Okay. Yeah, 10 years. And then uh, I'm the vice president for research, as we said. Um, I've been at Tech for about 20 years. Um, my uh, family came to New Mexico a uh, long, long time ago. Uh, one of the interesting things, the story I like to tell when we're talking to Carlsbad and, and WIP people, uh, when I was a graduate student at New Mexico Tech, I worked for a guy named Marvin Wilkening, who was um, a descendant of the Manhattan Project uh, and then stayed in New Mexico to become a professor at New Mexico Tech. I was working in his lab in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, he said, I have to leave for a day or two. He came down to Carlsbad, came back. I said, gee, what what were you doing down there? And he says, a bunch, of, a bunch of us were talking about storing radioactive waste in, uh, in salt deposits. And I said, what do you think about that? And he goes, I think it's a kind of a good idea. He says, politically, they might run into some problems, but <laughs> technically, it seems like an okay thing. So he was a pretty smart guy. So anyway, um, I'm going to go through and tell you what we've done, uh, what we found out. And then what I want, uh, I, we also want to know, uh, is, are there things that we haven't covered, other things? There's always more and more things that we could look into. Uh, we want to know. Uh, what concerns uh, people here in Carlsbad may have, uh, and uh, uh, we may be able or may not be able to look into those. We can't do everything for everyone, uh, but we want to do as good a job as we can. Uh, so, of course, just a little bit of background um, of the whip, whip incident. Uh, we were tasked um, uh, to examine what the TAT uh, and LANL had uh, done and review the circumstances of the, two, of the February 2014 incidents. Uh, our focus is to determine the conditions that led up to the rupture of the drum and to review the conclusions that DOE had made. Um, we want to be complete and transparent in our review uh, and we want to make everything available to the public. That's why we're having public meetings. That's why everything that we do is on our website. This is the timeline of the steps that we've taken uh, in this process. We started in December of 14. My, how time flies. <laughs> right. uh, we started in December 14 uh, with a preliminary review of the TAT report. The TAT report wasn't quite official at that time, but they were gracious enough to give us a um, preliminary copy so we could start to examine that. In February, we met with uh, Don Hancock from Southwest Research uh, to find out what concerns um, he had had, uh, and, uh, and we've continued to meet with him, with him right, Michael? Um, yes. uh, you've met with him just recently, haven't you? Just, you've met with him monthly, right? So we've kept uh, Don in the, in the loop all through this to make sure that there's no surprises. Uh, my um, deal, if you will, with Don Hancock is that we, would, uh, we wouldn't uh, try and get, uh, uh, come up to the 11th hour and spring anything on anybody. That, We'd tell him what, what we were doing. He would tell us what his concerns were. And I think we've had a pretty good relationship over the, over the past year. Um, in April, uh, March through April, we did an in-depth review of the TAT. So we rolled up our sleeves, looked through the report, uh, and tried to see what made sense, what didn't make sense, uh, and uh, essentially came up with a set of questions. Um, and so in May, we forwarded those questions uh, to the TAT for review. Uh, in um, August, we went up to Los Alamos and um, had a detailed presentation from the people from Los Alamos. And at that time, uh, they had uh, done uh, quite a bit of analysis and were just getting ready to conduct some drum tests. And I think those drum tests have now become very, very famous. Uh, um, they've uh, really done a lot to explain from our perspective what has happened. But the first time we met with Los Alamos uh, was just prior to them doing the drum tests. Uh, and then also in August, we met with a TAT uh, at, uh, in Albuquerque uh, for them to, prevent, uh, to present their responses to our questions. Um, I know Paul Shoemaker was there uh, while we did that. Um, it was, um, I thought, a very invigorating uh, interaction back and forth. Uh, we're talking about all of the different um, uh, analysis that were done, assumptions that were made. Um, and also the scope of their work. Um, one of the most important things in any of these investigations is, 
is to define the scope and stay within that scope. Um, as I said earlier, they, uh, they can wander off and uh, you can get trapped in, in chasing a uh, whole uh, different set of, of um, requirements that may not address the original answer that you want. So we, we talked about the scope also a lot. Um, in September, we issued a uh, interim report that uh, had the questions and the responses uh, from the TAT team. Uh, in October, we met again with uh, Los Alamos and uh, they had uh, partial results from their drum tests. Um, I, my understanding is the drum tests continue, uh, some of the drum testing continues on today, but um, they've had some very dramatic responses. Uh, also in October timeframe, uh, some former EEG, uh, Environmental Evaluation Group, uh, employees who had uh, retired uh, responded to our interim report. They had a number of questions. Um, and uh, we started to look at those questions and respond to them. Uh, and uh, then our team also uh, issued an updated interim report. Uh, our, our report in September had a few things that we wanted to correct. Uh, and also, uh, we had had the uh, results from the flannel drum test um, as well by that time. Uh, November, December, just recently, um, we uh, uh, began to, we followed up with the EEG and, and provided them with answers to uh, their questions. We have not posted them yet on our website. That's, um, that's correct, right, Julie? <laughs> yeah, right. We have not posted them yet on our website. Uh, we thought it was uh, um, fair to them to uh, send them back our responses to their questions and give them a chance to interact back and forth a little bit before we put them up. But um, uh, if anybody wants to see them, we'd be happy to, to show those. We just haven't put them up on the web yet until we have some interaction with them. Um, and uh, now in February, uh, we'll be uh, conducting um, uh, further reviews related to the WIP facility, uh, trying to tie up loose ends, and also hold this meeting so that we can uh, uh, give you feedback and also get feedback you from you. Sure. Sure. So our mission, as I said before, was to conduct a complete transparent review of the work that DOE did. So that's the scope of our work, to review the reports that DOE has issued. And that's basically just the TAC report? Uh, the TAC and the land report. Okay. So you limited yourself, or did somebody tell you to limit yourself, to restrict yourself to that scope? Um, we've also looked at the... Uh, um, at the Accident Investigation Board. Uh, we've looked at that report. Uh, we thought it was more effective for us to focus on the TAC report, uh, although we, we still looked at that. We weren't restricted in any way. What we chose to do is look at those reports to see uh, if we could uh, determine how, how consistent they are. Correct was published in the evaluation of some accident reports. No. You only looked at the tax Correct. Right. right. No. no, that's all we published. We've looked at other documents, but the only thing we've, we've published is our review of the tax report. It's a very small part of the overall yes. complex. Right. Yes. So, so you restricted yourself. Right. Can you tell us why you restricted yourself to that? Because oh, yeah. the TAP report doesn't say anything about risk and hazards to the cities of Alfred and New Mexico. You're doing this on behalf or for the state of New Mexico, the right. citizens of New Mexico. Right. But you haven't really, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you haven't really looked at what is the real hazard or what no. is the magnitude of that. No. So why did you limit yourself to the tech report? Our charge, uh, we, what we took on as our charge, was to try and understand what happened, that, the, the circumstances that led up to the rupture of the drum. Which is a scientific question. Correct, and we're scientists. Who is funding? The Department of Energy Project. And we had a, we had a discussion with that, uh, with uh, Don Hancock, uh, relative to how can this be independent if um, the Department of Energy is, is funding it? 
And um, our response to that is that's, a, that's what universities do. We get funded by government agencies to conduct independent research. And you know that Don Hancock is being funded by the DOE too? Oh, that's, I, 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 that's fine with me. I'm, um, uh, I, I'm just making a statement that as a university, we feel a responsibility to do independent work no matter where the funding comes from. You, if, you can always question that. That's fine. You, you, you did a science report and you limited yourself to the science. And it really puzzles me why you went to Don Hancock, because neither Don Hancock nor anyone in this group has ever published anything on scientific aspects of work. They have no scientific record, no publication record Our anything. Our reason for going to him was he had expressed an interest in um, having an independent review. And since he expressed that interest, we said, okay, what, what is it that you're looking for? As a, as a member of the public. Okay, so to go beyond the timeline, uh, here, is the technical, uh, here is the key findings um, of the uh, TAD investigation. Uh, it's available uh, uh, on our website as a PDF. Um, we um, looked at, again, the scientific methods. We looked at the methods, the software, the modeling, and the results of, uh, of the findings of the TAT. Um, when we uh, compared the TAT work to Los Alamos, uh, they uh, closely were aligned. Um, the TAT used some generally accepted methods. The conclusions uh, provided by the TAT were reasonable uh, and consistent, we thought. Uh, with the physical evidence that was, um, uh, that was shown to us. Uh, the TAT had an extremely focused charter. Um, this is an important point, I think, in that um, this extremely focused charter has very positive things to it. It has a narrow focus, which helps it uh, to um, uh, minimize uh, getting lost in the weeds. Uh, of course, the negative part of that is... Uh, it could look to something of being overlooked, an important event uh, that may not be considered uh, if it's not uh, within their narrow focus. Uh, so we think that uh, the, uh, one of our comments is um, uh, uh, we come on both sides of this issue of, of the focus of the TAP report. It's good that it's, it's a narrow focus, but also uh, it, that does have some drawbacks that people should be aware of. Right? Um, the TAP concluded that the organic kitty litter mixture and the nitrate salt ultimately result, uh, resulted in the rupture of uh, 68660, uh, and that is uh, supported by the physical evidence and the modeling that was conducted by Sandia and Los Alamos. Um, our team also agrees with the TAC conclusion that radiation in the drum did not play a significant role in one ray reaction. I want to spend just a, a little bit, of, a second, talking about that. Uh, you'll hear me talk more and more about a runaway reaction. This is a, a chemical reaction whose temperatures will slowly rise, there'll be a reason. Um, we may know uh, very accurately, or we may not know at all the reason for a slow temperature rise, but at some point, the temperature gets to a point where chemical reactions start to take place, and then those chemical reactions will run away and accelerate very quickly, generating a lot of heat and a lot of gas, which can cause a rupture. Radiation can add to that temperature increase, uh, but when we look at the amount of radiation in the drums, uh, we are confident, as is the TAT, as is Los Alamos, that the amount of energy that radiation in the drum would have added to the temperature rise in the drum is insignificant for the chemical reactions. Uh, we looked at uh, the truck fire. Uh, there was a lot of investigation by the TAT um, on the truck fire of February 5th. Uh, and that uh, there is really um, very difficult to find any way to link uh, the truck fire and the rupture of the drum. Uh, basically, the location of the truck fire was uh, far enough away from the drum that it um, uh, f uh, seems physically impossible uh, for there to be a connection uh, between that fire and the, and the drum rupture. Um, now, the Los Alamos. Uh, Findings. Uh, nitrate salts and kitty litter create potential for um, exothermic chemical reaction. Uh, if we tell our freshman chemistry students at New Mexico Tech, if you put uh, orga organics 
uh, with nitrate salts and oxygen, it's gonna, <laughs> there, there's going to be a runaway reaction. That conclusion is, I think, obvious to basic, uh, any basic chemist, right? Um, Right, I'm sorry, yeah, so that, that, that heat will come out of that. Um, chemical model of the drum, uh, which uh, contained content similar to 68660, uh, confirmed that the drum should have breached. So the analysis said that, yes, indeed, the mixture was, uh, um, uh, the chemical mixture was one that should have uh, run away and caused a breach. Um, the models that we looked at were descriptive and not predictive, meaning that, um, uh, the parameters that they adjusted in the model could um, force the drum to rupture at any time they wanted it to. Uh, and so you can't really predict when the drum would rupture, but you can come to a, a basic conclusion that based on just about any combination, the uh, drum would eventually rupture given a rise in heat. Um, the nitrates, the, the, um, the kitty litter, and the water can generate heat on themselves. They can raise the temperature. Lannell showed by 60 degrees. Um, and this initial temperature rise is certainly high enough to trigger the exothermic reaction, uh, which resulted in, the, in a drum rupture. Uh, uh, environmental signature of what we saw in panel seven uh, from the REACH test and uh, other uh, photographs uh, is consistent with the test and smears of the breech drum uh, at uh, Los Alamos. Um, the, um, the, just to, to recap, and um, we feel that we're not, um, uh, we don't want to speak for Los Alamos and for the, the drum test that they conducted. I would uh, hope that um, people here would get a chance to uh, see a presentation from them. The, uh, they did uh, assemble some drums that were similar in nature to 68660 uh, and put them under a uh, condition where they were, they were heated, uh, and those drum, the drum ruptured um, at about the same time that you would expect a 68660 to rupture from the processing that it went through. So when we looked at the results of the drum test, when the, the bottom line to us, you can look at all the modeling that goes on, uh, all the predictive uh, uh, analysis, um, that gives us a, a warm, fuzzy feeling, but when we saw the results of the actual physical test of the drum test, we said, yeah, that's what happened. And it looks like those conditions are, are pretty much the uh, same as what was in 68660. So that uh, we're confident that um, the conditions uh, of the tested drum were, were similar to 68660. Um, no two drums are exactly the same, so we couldn't, uh, Los Alamos can't uh, I identically uh, replicate that drum. But uh, it's a reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable representation of what they had. Um, the, um, and the modeling showed that there's a, a lot of variables that can lead to the exact process as to, which, uh, as to when it runs away. Oh, that's my last slide. Right? Nope. One more. Right? That's my, this is my last No, it might. What happened? Did you do that? There we go. Okay. Um, the, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, I've, I guess I've kind of talked about this already a little bit. I got ahead of myself. I apologize for that. Um, variables tested. Here's the variables that were tested in the Lionel drum, the ratio of the sweet, the salt composition, the neutral, neutralizers, and the influence of radioactive uh, elements. Uh, and he, you can read the conclusions. Um, there was a very high potential for reaction. Um, and that the conditions led uh, to the breaching of the drum. Um, and uh, I think the bottom one is important. Uh, breach of the drum containing sweet is possible even at ambient uh, temperatures. Oh, there's a lot more slides about this. I don't know why I jumped. I think I hit, I hit a wrong button here. Okay. Uh, our understanding is uh, Los Alamos is continuing to uh, do headspace uh, gas testing on, on the drums. Uh, does anybody know, here know? Is that a valid statement on our part? That's one thing we want to find out. So the, the tests continue. They, they are continuing, right? Yeah, that's what, that's, that was our assumption, right? Um, and uh, plans um, communicated to us in the fall were that they would prepare some more uh, salt sweet mixtures. Uh, and that they would look at these uh, um, in some bottles and then test the bottles on a weekly 
uh, basis over a number of weeks, right? Um, and that they would uh, see the results of those soon, I hope. Path forward. Um, there are a, a number of drums uh, that have uh, this mixture with uh, kitty litter and the nitrate salts. Um, they are uh, both uh, in Los Alamos, they're in Andrews, Texas, and of course there's the one that are in uh, panel seven. Um, the um, uh, number of avenues to go forward, the uh, uh, one that Lanel has picked as its top option is to uh, add zeolite and, uh, with cementation um, to drums that have the potential uh, mixture. Um, there are other uh, options, um, and uh, we're anxiously await to see uh, what path forward they're going to take. Um, the zeolite option was used, uh, EMRTC is a New Mexico tech organization, the Energetic Materials Research and Test Center, where we did some tests on a similar type of mixture with zeolites in 2010, and that was uh, successful in neutralizing them. Um, uh, the important thing to note here is uh, all options require uh, Los Alamos to uh, obtain a processing uh, permit, which they currently don't have, which will take time. This is the uh, strategy that Lionel has, has proposed to us uh, to um, resume the waste treatment operations. Um, uh, I'm not going to really um, go over that in much detail. Uh, suffice it to say that um, everybody is looking at this uh, very closely uh, to make sure that um, the process that goes forward uh, is one that won't result in a chemical uh, composition that is uh, volatile in, uh, in, in future drums. Uh, yeah? Can you go back to, yeah, right here. What, what is that zeolite option used before? Uh, that was not used on a S wheat thing. I mean, what does that mean? The, that bottom, that bottom bullet. Next to the bottom. Right, the zeolite option used at EMRTC. We we did some tests at at the Energetic Materials Research and Test Center uh -huh. to look at and to um, take various mixtures of uh, of the uh, kitty litter. Um, uh, zeolite. Correct. Uh, and the inorganic. Right. right, there we go. <laughs> Let, let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, um, we tested those through uh, a range of tests, which I'll call are the DOT standard tests, which uh, um, test for sensitivity in these types of materials. And um, those uh, tests show that the material was insensitive. Okay, did I answer your question? Well, well, yeah, okay. I, I don't know if the public knew it, but... <laughs> yes? What about the uh, plastic? Uh, there's been discussions many places about that's an accelerant. It's like gasoline, you know, the plastic bags that it's in. I'm going to throw my throw my, 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 my kind of sense of what's Yeah, the plastic fighter, there's been some thought about that, but uh, we didn't see that directly in the drum test. No, and it, it wasn't just the kitty litter that's the problem. The neutralizer they used was also a problem. Um, that's also an organic-based material that can react with the nitrates. And there was some suggestion that some of the other materials that they put into the drum as well, um, like the bismuth glove, uh, might have uh, accelerated things as well. So the, the conclusion, basically, do you agree that it was just the S-suite? But you're not really saying that. <laughs> we're, we're convinced, based on the test that was done, that that combination of the sweet and the salts can lead to the drum rupture. 
that, that it, because um, it did. I mean, the, the test showed that it did. Now, are there other conditions? Yeah, for sure there's other conditions that could lead to it, yeah. And you want to minimize everything you can. Anything else? Uh, Los Alamos is going through corrective actions. One of the things that we saw, another thing that, that we'll be putting in our report um, is, uh, for one thing, we think Los Alamos did an outstanding job of digging into and investigating exactly what happened. Um, this was a complicated process, a lot of variables, uh, and they spent a lot of effort and a lot of time, and they did good science to try and understand what happened, and I think they got a conclusion that, that we're all satisfied with. Another thing that came out of this, and I think this is one of the important things that, that, that we've seen, is that the conditions that led up to the mixtures of drums that were not consistent with the procedures was that there was a tremendous amount of pressure on Los Alamos to get those drums in the, in the storage. And in order to uh, acquiesce to that pressure, they hired a lot of contractors and gave those contractors the assignment to get those drums moving. And so the whole focus was on get the drums uh, assembled, get them processed, and get them down to width. Um, that is part of the problem we see as what leads to uh, uh, mixtures be, being put together that don't necessarily follow the procedures that are being laid down. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that uh, we will um, push on is that there has to be a balance between the pressure to get those waste drums out of Los Alamos and doing them in a proper fashion so that they're not done hastily and they're not done on a low bid basis, as we like to say, um, and so that the things will be done in an orderly fashion and properly reviewed uh, at the appropriate levels within the laboratory. Um, this is our assessment to date. Um, the uh, mixing of organic kitty litter with uh, the waste uh, prepared for shipment ultimately led to the runaway reaction. Uh, that at that uh, in um, February of 2016 seems to be uh, a pretty obvious conclusion. Uh, I guess I'll challenge all of you a year to a year and a half ago. Um, you may, uh, there may have been a lot more opinions of to review these things. Uh, and um, we're fairly confident that indeed that is the correct conclusion. Um, the potential for triggering mechanisms was examined, but uh, I don't think we'll ever know what the exact trigger mechanism is that led to the uh, uh, runaway reactions. Um, all the drums, uh, one of the things that we were very concerned with was accounting for all of the drums uh, that have uh, had the organic kitty litter um, and um, that those drums are going to be dealt with properly. Um, it's fairly uh, straightforward uh, that if the drums are kept cool, the runaway action potential is very low. And also, um, something that was mentioned just a little bit earlier, and I think we've talked about this over the past year, the longer the drums sit, the less potential they have uh, for a runaway uh, reaction as well. So uh, if they haven't gone off yet and we've kept them cool, then chances are we're going to be in pretty good shape. Um, the drums that are already in the repository obviously should stay there. The, that's the right place for them. Um, moving them around and agitating them uh, would not be an uh, appropriate thing to do. Um, and if uh, the organic materials are removed from the waste stream, we feel that the potential for a similar drum uh, rupture would be all but eliminated. Okay. Uh, we don't feel that the radioactive nucleides played a significant role in a runaway reaction. Uh, we found no evidence uh, between the truck fire and the drum uh, rupture. Uh, obviously, I think this is another one of those, yeah, everybody agrees that safety procedures already in place must be reviewed and uh, be of high concern. That's always the case uh, when you're dealing with volatile materials at any location. Um, and we are confident the risk has been mitigated by eliminating uh, the organic material uh, in the <coughs> underground drums. Um, and uh, the drums above ground continue to be uh, needed to be addressed. I have a question. Yeah. It's organic. So that, it sounds like you are thinking organic materials which cause this thing. Kitty litter? Is that? 
combination of the organics in the kitty litter with the uh, with the other components of the drum. Well, how would you keep the organic out of it? I mean, I get this idea that there's a jumble of all kinds. It's almost no different what's at the landfill up here. You know, yeah. I mean, all jumbled together. Right. Is that a good characterization, maybe, or not? <laughs> no. no. Um, I don't know, you want to comment? Uh, from a well, I mean, it was a straightforward mistake when they were trying to find an absorbent for the liquids and material. Yeah. The um, protocol called for an inorganic kitty litter, and the people who actually went out to purchase it purchased an organic kitty litter. And I would, I would organic material. I characterize it as a straightforward mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Right, yeah. yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with you that it wasn't. Um, I, I, but I, I mean, think organics and, and nitrate salts don't. And, you know, even in our stock room, we have to be very careful to store those in very separate areas. I, I, we might get be getting hung up on language, though. Um, can you eliminate all the organics in the drum? I mean, you can't emphatically say that there's no organics in the drum, right? But if you take a material, uh, you know, separate areas. Uh, I, uh, we might get be getting hung up on language, though. Um, can you eliminate all the organics in the drum? I mean, you can't emphatically say that there's no organics in the drum, right? But if you take a material, uh, you know, 50 pound bags of a material that has a heavy organic component to it and pour it in the drum, that's going to cause a problem, right? So it's not real. And, and okay. Right. So you have to have both the and then, and at that point, then it's just waiting for a heat source to for it to take off. Right. But even within the drum test, they had the layers within the, the model drum, and some things like the plastic liner were in a lower layer. And the drum test clearly shows that the runaway reaction occurred within the kitty litter and nitrate salt mixture, and not within the other layers of the drum. Where other contaminants were, right? Yes. Was a contributor to this whole affair the fact that there were very low pH solutions that the S wheat was dumped into, and when you dump cellulose into acid, you make sugar, and those of us who eat sugar know it's very reactive. <laughs> now that was what the triethanolamine was intended uh, to do. Okay. It was to, to raise the pH up to the required um, protocol, and then, then the, the, the kitty litter was put in. The triethanolamine was an unfortunate choice because it itself is an organic material that can react with the nitrate salts as well. And so there were several things that were combined together that should never have. That leads to my next question. <laughs> Why did you, you're looking at basically, as Norbert was pointing out, you're looking at is there a continuing risk at the repository? And you say, nah, keep it cool and it'll be fine. Now, well, no, no, no. Uh, but, 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 but no. I want to, I want to explain that in just a second. I, yeah. No, I understood yeah. what you said. No. I want to go somewhere else. No. <laughs> okay. Where I want to go is there's another risk, which was in. Uh, what you talked about, the triethanolamine story. Weren't workers coming to their managers saying, we see a reaction we didn't expect? Now that is a risk for those workers. Why is it you didn't address that in your, are you addressing that in your report at all? Saying that? Well, that's more an engineering management problem than a chemistry problem. Yes, they did go to their managers, but the, the problem really started with they knew they needed to raise the pH of this material, and they basically went to a chart without their, without a managerial approval, and said, that neutralizer, that one looks like it'll work. And uh, so in a normal uh, engineering process, they should have had some um, approval of that, that change in the protocol. Are you so, addressing this at all in your report? Uh, not the current report. But you will in the one that's final, I guess. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, if, if that's a concern, yes. I mean, well, uh, that's what we're here for. It's, uh, it's, it, it's a concern.
concern that was flagged in the AIB report, mm. and it was done quite nicely there, but I thought that you would have also doubled down on that from a chemistry perspective and said even that was a very poor choice to make. So. Yeah, we'll, 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 put, we'll take a look, a closer look at that. That's why I said, what? We're here to find out what, what other things are of concern. Yeah, no, it, it's changing. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I stand, uh, I, I really do, uh, as a scientist, um, when I looked at, at the process that Lanel's going through, they are doing uh, a very good job of understanding what went wrong and how they can make sure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, they've convinced me. I, I, I mean, that's, that, that's, um, I know they have a long way to go. They have a lot of people to convince, but from my perspective, uh, it looks like they're they're going down the right path. And they self admit that they believe that they made mistakes, right. yeah. and that they've not tried to cover these things up by taking them under the rug. They, they've said we made mistakes, and we're going to do what it takes to uh, make sure that mistakes don't occur a second time. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've never worked in a in a in an industry where People didn't have errors. It's unfortunate that this, this error is of the magnitude that it was, but things happen. Yes. Yeah, but let me put forth my hypothesis. Is had no concern whatsoever with the chemical uh, hazardous yeah, part of this. Um, they had done tests prior, I showed you one that they did in 2010, to determine that the zeolite mixture would not produce uh, a mixture that uh, was volatile. Yeah, so okay. they were looking at the chemistry long ago. Uh, that, that work was commissioned by Carlsbad. It was done by a, a sub-organization of Los Alamos that's housed here at Carlsbad. Well, I they commissioned it to, 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 to determine the amount of zeolite that should be put in to neutralize the material and to eliminate the uh, reactivity of the nitrate salts. 
and Los Alamos, in its wisdom, up on the hill, changed that recipe for many reasons that you alluded to. It works chemistry, right? Well, it, and I will agree, they should have taught the chemistry because when their technicians were actually making the mixture, they saw some bubbling and a, a brown purple gas coming off, which would have been a clear signature that right. the, the nitrates were reacting. <laughs> yeah. But, but whether it's a sub-organization or not, there was attention paid to the chemistry early on. I win. Right. Okay, well, I mean, it's, yeah, not okay. the National Lab. They were focusing primarily on nuclear, and chemistry was a stepchild. And they that presented it. the real hazard. And nobody did a comparative evaluation, and please correct me if you did, of the radiological risk versus the chemical risk, of the radiological risk versus the risk to workers from, you know, uh, a fire. I, I, um, if you're interested, I would actually go back in the archives of the EEG, uh, EEG, the Environmental Evaluation Group, uh, to see what types of of uh, 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 risk evaluations were done. I I, I haven't. Look through those recently. Uh, uh, history. I'm looking at it from the perspective of post coincidence, yeah. and I have not seen from anybody, including you, group, anything about comparative risk. And you know, we're not so that we're not the risk at all. We're doing the risk analysis. Yeah. You want to talk about that root collapse? Well, I'm sure what part of the root collapse you? Or you said the root collapse caused the no 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 no. I was saying that in the Accident Investigation Board report on the drum breach and the radiological release. The primary hypothesis they had in that was a roof fall or a roof bolt puncturing the drum. When they had absolutely no idea what the cause was, that was the one they pounced on. And nobody listened at the time to the mining engineers and geologists that said, this is BS because panel seven was the, was the last mine panel, and by the way, before any waste is put in any of these rooms, it's actually certified by a uh, professional engineer that this should actually last during the lifetime of filling this room. So that was the least likely explanation. But the DOE and those Alamos, I think everybody in the complex ran with that, and then because they ran with that hypothesis, then somebody whose name I'm still looking for signed off on the decision on shipping drums from Los Alamos to WCS, which in hindsight now is probably the biggest screw up as a result of this whole thing. So you didn't look at any of that, right? Well, like you said, that was the very first thing they assumed the roof collapsed and caused that. But right. And again, like you said, did, did right you? when there is the fresh opening, and the fresh support, this like it. This like it, yeah. Did, did, did you sort of highlight that? Or did you, did anyone that you know of scream at that and say, hey, this makes no sense? Well, I think that was well established. Later on, they, well, yeah. later on in the report, they put that aside, and then you don't see anything like that in past report. But they never. But, but remember, when you work with natural material, like rock, there's always a chance that it's not about concrete that you can evaluate all the parameters. Tiny chance you can never eliminate, but was it a likely possibility? It was not. It was the least likely of all potential hypotheses at the time. Nevertheless, that was the one that was pursued, and that was the one that had ill consequences for the shipment of these drums to WCS, with which we still don't know what to do because they don't keep them in a refrigerator like the ones in Los Alamos, right? By the way, it's very, I think, illuminating that at every one of these meetings, Los Alamos representatives are conspicuously absent. <laughs> um, any other, uh, other comments? Yeah. What Norbert's talking about is the conclusion in the EIB first phase right. report on the release. The second phase report, of course, they corrected that. But you're right. And while they were running with that assumption, things were done that, in hindsight, shouldn't have been done. But and you nobody's said, responsible but, for it. But they, no name attached to that but they, but anyway. In fairness, they said at the start, we didn't go to the ARV. We looked at SAT and those right. elements. We're, we're doing a scientific review of that. The, the, those conclusions, I, I mean, I, I, um, I, don't, I don't know what, uh, how I would even begin to comment on decisions that other people made that I haven't 
uh, really reviewed. That's not part of our charter. Part of your charter. Who sets the charter? We do. Then again, why did you restrict it so much? Because you Because I wanted the, to be able to get it done. <laughs> you are the New Mexico um, state-financed uh, institution of higher learning. And I think, correct me again if I'm wrong, that the first interest that you should have as, again, the New Mexico taxpayer finance institution should be to look at the real risk we and real risk assessment and risk comparison, the risk-based assessment, those kinds of things. The because what you did is a nice scientific sort of PhD thesis type work, but it has no relevance whatsoever to the safety of the citizens of New Mexico. It has absolutely no relevance I, to that. Oh well, I will, we'll agree to disagree on that. I think it does have relevance as to uh, why the. Uh, why the drums ruptured and how we can make sure that they don't rupture. We are not the policy people. If you want, if you're interested in policies and decisions that were made, you should be talking to Ryan Flynn and not us. Is, is what you're asking basically, are we reviewing the decision making process within the WIP culture that led to that particular decision being made? I'm wondering with what is the benefit of your work to the citizens of New Mexico. I think it has scientific benefit, it makes a nice publication, all that stuff, but I don't really see any direct connection there to the real benefit to the citizens of New Mexico. But knowing the, the, the actual cost, uh, the, so the details that one out. helps out uh, but you don't believe what's prevent what's future events. I didn't say that. It's not a matter of belief anyway. It's amazing that a scientist says believe. You know, my 86 year old mother asked me about four days after I told her that we were doing this. She said, Well, Michael, why are you doing this? I said, Well, mother, I'd like to be able to tell you whether or not the, what the probability of this happening again is. And that's really where we're at. Here. That, that, you ask, What is the relevance to the citizens of New Mexico? My family's lived here a real long time. And what I would tell you is, is that my mother would like to know whether or not she in Silver City sitting in her living room is going to be affected by this again, or is this going to be a continuing pattern of occurrence of that with? That's, that, that is the purpose of this. We're reviewing the people who have done this, these assessments. We're reviewing them work, and as a state-supported institution, we're able to tell the citizens that it will, what, the problem, what that probability is. Uh, and that's really the purpose of this, to set policy, et cetera, that that's not within the charge of what this group is uh, charged to charge with doing. As a matter of fact, one thing we were not, we were told is not in our privy was to address policy issues. That that's Ryan Flynn's. It's not policy. Risk assessment is not policy. You, you, you are putting it down into the political realm. I didn't use the word policy at all. It has to do with you are experts in your technical fields. You have an idea of what risks are. You also have a model right there who can model and compare, and probably all of you have that capability to some extent. And, uh, but let me ask you a sort of straightforward question here. Um, which ones of the former EEG personnel actually did participate in this review? And who are the two? Can you uh, name some? Yeah, sure. James Chanel and George. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you all for coming. Uh, hey, please. I do have one thing. Sure. Uh, I don't know who said, uh, uh, referred to a little bit about what's going on at WCS. When all those drums got sent there after that, when y'all didn't know what was really happening with it. Did has anybody went into those drums and tried to figure out if there's a problem with those drums at WCS? They're not. They're not. Oh, they're not. Yeah, they're not accessible. They're 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 stored away. Uh, Are they basically concrete or concrete poured over top of them or something? Is that what I remember? Uh, there is there are drums packaged within larger boxes, and then the larger boxes are placed in eight-inch thick concrete culverts that are 12 feet high, and then that whole whole space on the inside is filled with quarter-inch pea grass. Then they are buried, have been buried in the federal cell 
their interaction has had 12 feet of sand that's been placed on top of us. So it's, it's not easy. That's what we're doing. Our tests were not easy. It's easy. <laughs> I'm right. just curious. But it sounds like that may be a, if this happened once, and the same kind of drones are coming into that w, so I don't know how much is there. There, there is a, there, we, we think that there is a potential there. But again, if they're not, temperature isn't elevated, and the longer they sit, the less uh, reactive they become. Uh, they've been sitting there for, for quite some time now, um, so it, uh, on the order of two years. So their um, potential seems to be diminishing, but in this game, you can never say never. Well, they were buried specifically in response to the elevated temperature problem, right. Right. just sitting out in the sun. Yeah, they, they, so they, they didn't want them sitting out. They buried them so that they would try to control the temperature. temperature. <laughs> Not a good thing in Andrews, Texas, no, right? That's what I was say. It's just as hot there as it is here. <laughs> what was your budget? How much money have you spent so far? How much do you plan to spend in the future and on what? The total budget from the Department of Energy was around $750,000. we have spent about 300000 of that. To uh, to continue uh, con to continue to look at uh, anything that may happen in the future, um, we may not necessarily execute all of that money. Um, we just want to make sure we have enough in reserve to respond to any questions. Um, as I'm sure, as like anything, as it, um, the decision becomes closer and closer to re-establishing uh, the process um, into WIP. There may be more questions that we may be called upon to look at, and we want to make sure we have enough money to respond to that. So you've got basically sort of a about half of the budget. open $400,000 contract to address issues that DOE identifies. No, actually, we take, we, uh, we take our direction more from Ryan Flynn than, than, than we do from DOE. So you work under the, under the direction? We, I wouldn't say we're not under the, 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 the agreement was we weren't under the direction of anybody, um, but uh, that we would respond to um, questions that, that come up and in particular things that Ryan Flynn would uh, Things are important. That agreement, I guess it's in writing, we put that on the website so that we can see as to who is doing what. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, and it, this is who's doing it. I mean, we, don't, we haven't. Um, uh, placed any subcontracts that uh, there might be. There's one small subcontract. I think we have a subcontract for the filming tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speculate for me. Uh, these drums that were sent to WCS, they got hotter than blazes for a while, and then they were covered up and cooled off. Does that decrease the likelihood of a reaction since they've gone through this cycle, cycle heating? Yes. Okay. I thought so. And the, the, the drum tests in lab tend to support that. Uh -huh. So why don't we just move them to it and forget all this motion? <laughs> I don't know. That's what I've heard. Oh, yeah? He's, He's heard everything I said. I know he can't transport them. Well, he can't be as long as you label them. You can't transport them and you can't process them. <laughs> Other than that, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, please uh, go to our website. Um, and there's a place there where you can uh, get a hold of us and ask us questions and make comments. You can't transport them and you can't process them. <laughs> Other than that, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can't transport them and you can't process them. <laughs> Other than that, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> You can't transport them and you can't process them. <laughs> Other than that, you can do whatever you want. You can't transport them and you can't process them. <laughs>